1970, December, David Mazels called me and said, Ron, I'm going to be on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And do you have any messages you want to get across while we're talking about Give Me Shelter? We're going to be talking about the Stones tour and all that. And I said, yes, I have a message for you. And I gave him my message. He called me back later on that night and said, well, we didn't get a chance to give your message. So right now, tonight, I'm going to give you the message that I gave David Mazels in December 1970. The Rolling Stones never hired the Hells Angels. Okay, and I'm gonna prove it, but now I'll give you the backstory. When I was trying to decide what I wanted to be when I grow up and I was getting ready to go to high school, my mother said, well, my brother's an accountant. You could always be an accountant, it's a good job. And since there's nobody else in Florida doing much, I said, okay, I'll check on being an accountant. I went to bookkeeping classes and all that. And then by the second year in the University of Miami, my uncle said, well, come up during the summers and let's see if you really can do the job and enjoy it. So I went up the first year in 62 and, and he was doing small record companies like uh, Scepter Records with songs like Soldier Boy and the Shirelles. And so I was doing the books for those companies. I'd go in while the music people would be playing and I'd be writing up books and doing numbers and all that. And it was fun. And then I went back during the summer, but, I mean, so I went back to school, came back the next summer and he was handling Sam Cooke and Bobby Vinton. And Bobby Vinton was great because he was like this Polish singer who was fantastic because I always like entertainers that deliver more than what you're expecting. And he would go in there and sing his hits like Blue Velvet and all that, but his father was a band leader and Bobby would go in and play like 15 instruments. So if you're going to watch Bobby Vinton sing, you got Bobby Vinton singing and then playing a whole orchestra for you. So that was a pleasure I learned more about entertainment. Then came Sam Cooke who had a voice and I used to talk with Sam and go out to different dates that he did during the summer. And then uh, Sam would say to me, Ron, you know what my act is? Because people are always talk about the different acts of what they do. He'd say, my act is I basically bite my lower lip and then I jump over the microphone cord. That was his act because his voice was so amazing. It just enthralled everybody as it was. So I went back to the school and then that summer, well, in 64, Sam got killed. My uncle's all upset he got murdered. And the thing we learned then, though, was, of course, he didn't have insurance for him. And, and it was a big problem. But it was, bottom line is, the next summer, 65, I'm graduating the University of Miami in accounting. I get ready. I go after the graduation. I go out and party. And I'm dancing to a song that we all loved at that time, Satisfaction. And I go up after the summer to school to find out that I'm going to be working with those guys that sang Satisfaction, the Rolling Stones. And when I first met them, they were on a cruise around Manhattan doing a press junket. And I met Mick and Keith mostly, and we sat and talked, and we were all roughly the same age, but Mick was six months older than me, which, so he always looked at me as the younger guy, which he hated because I took care of the money. But with the Stones, it was a case of we all met. It was really nice. The next time we were on a boat together, we went in the harbor by Shea Stadium and went to see this other group, the Beatles, at Shea Stadium. And we went, and that was funny because we walked off a yacht. I didn't know because it was a harbor. We walked off the yacht, and then we got over to Shea, and we went in, and it was a zoo. It was almost as packed as it now. It was really <laughs> jammed like you couldn't believe. And it was funny because we were walking in, and because I was Mick Jag with Mick Jagger and Keith Richard, I got to walk in right away. But the other interesting thing was they stopped my uncle, who's the manager, and they held him back. The security grabbed it, and my uncle screamed out, run, run. And I remember turning around and saying, he's with me. <laughs> And the cop let him through. And so we all talked about that for a while. Anyhow, we met the Beatles and we couldn't talk, couldn't hear anything, went out to watch the show at Shea, couldn't hear a thing. The kids were screaming like lunatics, so we left. I next am told, we go back to the thing, and I'm next, I go back to the office and I'm doing books as usual, writing up publishing royalties and all that. And my uncle says, listen, I want you to go on the road with the boys right now. That was that day. He said, I've decided you're going to represent me in the box office. So on that day, on the first tour leaving for Canada, I was joining the boys that I was dancing to a few months earlier. And the first experience, of course, was great to give me a future of what was good things going to happen because Keith had forgotten his passport and we're going to Canada. And so that was interesting because, like, luckily it wasn't anything like today. There was this heavyset guy, and I just said, Keith, stand behind that guy. And we ended up, he scooted by and snuck through, <laughs> and we never had a problem. And we were worried about it, but he did the same thing coming back. Security was much more lax than it used to be. 
but he got in. So that was the kind of relationship we had on, at the start where that would go on. And we all became close. The thing with the Stones is when I did the tour and the first date, I went out and saw the kids. By the way, the first date I learned something else besides he didn't have his passport and you got to pay attention to everything is my uncle had taken cop tickets out of the contracts with the promoters. So as any VIP will know, if you got tickets and you had to pay for them, all hell would pay instead of you. And the end result was I would have to go into the rooms with the promoters and tell them that they owed us money because they couldn't get their comp tickets to the you know, press and all that. So I learned having to deal with the hardships of being a young guy dealing with 40-year-old guys wanting to break your neck because you're taking their money. But the, and also when I went out after that first show, the music quieted early because there was a riot, a full-scale riot. And I mean, kids were crammed all the way. I had to fight through everything, and the, we stayed in the dressing rooms in the back for three hours before we could get out of that first date. So now we got the attitude with the way things are going. What I noticed with the Stones when I went into the groups and then into the shows was that each one of the Stones had their own fan club. There'd be signs for Keith, there'd be signs for Brian, for Mick, of course, who had the biggest fan club, Charlie, and even Bill, who just stood there and did nothing, had his own giant fan club. I mean, played bass, but, but so, <laughs> I mean, he just posed, he didn't dance. So he stood up, and, and went, so I went up to him and I said, you know, you guys are going to be around forever because you have these different fan bases. This giant, and they say, shut up. They didn't care about any of that, and I learned right away. To them, the Rolling Stones going on stage was a job. When they went up on that stage, they were the Rolling Stones performing. When they came off the stage, it was Mick, Brian, Keith, Bill, and Charlie. And that's the way it was. Like, always, oh, it's just like any five guys that you're hanging out with, like any five guys in five relationship with anything else in the world. It was always that dynamic. You know, there were always good, one guy they were always making fun of. There's always one guy they're picking on at different times. We all made fun of Bill because he was older. And then one time when I was at one room, they, they came in and uh, it was always surprising. Mick, Keith and Mick come into my room and they said, be quiet, be quiet. And Keith grabs a class and he puts it up against the wall and the room next to me was Brian Jones. And Brian was very friendly with Dylan. And so he had the glass up against the wall, I'm like, what's going on? And then Mick calls Keith and invitates, I'm sorry, Mick calls Brian in the next room and invitates Bob Dylan and said, Mr. Zimmerman for uh, Mr. Jones. <laughs> and it was like, and they were, fa and then you know, Brian screamed, shut up, Mick, I know it's you. But it was that kind of deal with all these guys getting on. So the first tour goes in 65, and the other thing about that I always thought was great was here I am, this little short Jewish accountant guy, and the photographer on that show was Garrett Mankiewicz, and we both were the outsiders. He played the camera, I played the adding machine, and the end result was Keith came after the tour and said, listen, let's go riding at Scottsdale. I've hired a guide and I've got all these things, and so Keith, to me, like, I mean, he asked us to join him after the tour to go horseback riding and camp out with John Wayne's guide and all this stuff. So that, to me, tells you how my feeling towards all of them was. That was already the beginning in 65. 66 came. It was another quick tour. And then my uncle says, oh, I want you to do represent me writing the checks on a movie in England. Mrs. Brown, you've got a lovely daughter with Herman's Hermits. So I went over and was producing a movie over there, meanwhile still dealing with the Stones. And then after the 66 tour, we did the 66 tour quickly, sorry, did that. Then comes to more and more with the films. My uncle then sends me to Japan to do a film, a spaghetti western in Kyoto. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. We had 15 typhoons, a couple of earthquakes. <laughs> We had two sets demolished, so I mean, that's, you know, you learn how to live under gunfire at that time. So I'd done that one, and while we were doing that in 68, we did a rock and roll circus, and they did Beggar's Banquet, all these other things that were happening with the stones that I was dealing with, which was still good. And then in uh, 68 also, just at the end of it, my uncle gets the Beatles, signs the Beatles. So. I'm now going between the Stones and the Beatles and the Beatles offices, and what I can tell you about that, it was the first time I went to meet the Beatles. My uncle said, go out and meet John Lennon. He's going to be looking for an estate. He and Yoko are out there looking for an estate out in the country. Come on out and you know, show that we care and represent us. So I went out to meet them, met John and Yoko, 
And we walked around this fantastic state with three lakes and horses and all this. Beautiful. And afterwards, I said, well, going back to the office. And I go out to the car from the office. It was a Rolls, of course. And John is going over to his Rolls. And as I'm walking to mine, at the top of his lungs, I hear, do I stink? And I'm, excuse me? And it's John Lennon saying, do I stink? And I said, no, what do you mean? He said, well, come ride with us. So I rode with John and Yoko for the trip. During the time, he's just having idea after idea, all these amazing ideas that he had creative that was just brilliant. And we, and by the way, another thing, besides, you know, besides that Rolling Stones didn't hire the Hells Angels, Yoko Ono didn't break up the Beatles. <laughs> Everybody else that tells you different wasn't there. But anyhow, so now we've got the way he treated Yoko. I mean, that, look, we would get into discussions, and every now and then Yoko would offer an idea or something, and he would say, shut up. But it was embarrassing at first, but it was just a way of saying, I'm making a point, don't interrupt me, because his points had long bases. <laughs> so the end result is we got, back to, that was, we got back to the office one time, and he was drawing ideas. He wanted to build houses covered with mirrors. Because if you covered it with mirrors, he said it would reflect nature. You know, you would just see the grass and the trees and the mountains and the sky. If you flew over in a plane, you'd just see the countryside. It was a great, you know, it was beautiful. But then every now and then he'd go, but you know, we could put those on Volkswagens too and imagine, I said, no, you got to see the cars. <laughs> but you'd get a little far out there so that the creative end would go so good. So I enjoyed being with them and doing all those things like that. Now, the other thing that happened was we were going to have a discussion at Apple about the, uh, they wanted to do another film project. And they were thinking about doing the trilogy, The Lord of the Rings or The um, Stranger in a Strange Land, the Heinlein film book at the time. So we were going to have a meeting to discuss that with John and, and Paul. And by the way, the thing that I had to say, sorry, the thing I mentioned at the beginning is when my uncle signed the Beatles, he signed John, Ringo, and he didn't sign Paul. So, you know, George as well. He, he didn't sign Paul. And so Paul was always there because Paul had his own nepotism and wanted his in-laws with his, Linda Eastman's family, which were publishing people. So there was that little bit of battle because of that. So we didn't talk that much. So we're now going to this meeting. And my uncle beforehand says to me, if you have an opinion, I don't want to hear it. If you know the film we're talking about, don't say a word about it. If anything, I don't want nothing. Keep your mouth shut. Just sit there and listen, okay? I, I never talk. So anyhow, I just sat there, and in the middle of the table is this big jar of cookies. And in that car, and I'm, I was have weight problems as most little guys. Like. Anyhow, I'm looking at the cookies the whole time, and John did like cookies too. So I watched the cookies, most of the discussion. And at the end of the meeting, which it was decided we couldn't, they couldn't do it because they, rightly so, they felt that Lord of the Rings would come out like a cartoon. And they really wanted to have it almost real life, and you couldn't do the real animation things that they wanted to do. So they passed on that. But when the meeting ended, John just stood up and slid over piece of paper to me, and on that piece of paper, he drew that bowl of cookies, <laughs> and with a big smile on his face, and he had the worm that was him with the goatee around it, and on the side of the jar, it just said, eat me. <laughs> so while John saw that, he saw this, but then, surprised to me, Paul comes over and hands me a piece of paper, and like I said, I wasn't expecting anything from Paul, and the piece of paper he had was he drew me like a Picasso guy, and I had sergeant stripes, epaulettes on my shoulders, like military and all this. He had my arms crossed, and he had my face and all that. And underneath it, he wrote, emotion picture industry. <laughs> and I thought that was like, you know, he knew, but it was like still the thing that got me most about all of that, which people, which if I knew a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and whatever it is, I have two pictures from John and Paul, done at the exact same moment under the exact same conditions. And it's interesting how each one came out with a different kind of thing. John with the joke humor of the food and Paul, emotion, picture, you know, on that, the more personal business side of it. So I always thought if they looked at those pictures and analyzed them, maybe they could understand what can make one guy write, you know, give peace a chance, and the other one, I want to be your man. All the, you know, just the differences are there. And by the way, I brought copies of those in their back. You can take a look at the images that they did for me. So with all that being said, I went to D D Ringo's house at times to help him get in, but I was also very close with George. 
George was, <laughs> George was like, just would always very spiritual and deep. He'd give me books and talk about heavy things with me. And he told me, well, I'll give this story now. And I, I can trust you all to keep it quiet. <laughs> Anyhow, he said the reason that he didn't, he told me he didn't get along with Paul. And he didn't like Paul and why they were enemies and all this. And I said, why? And he said, well, we once did an acid trip. Yes, they did drugs. He said, once did an acid trip. And he said, and Paul was freaking out that he was falling down a well. And he was trying to, he was scared to death he was falling down a well. And George said that I went over to him and I said, listen, hold my hand, trust me, I'll help you, I'll get you out of this. And he wouldn't take George's hand. So George said, based on that, he didn't trust me, I don't trust him, <laughs> and, and that was it. Yeah, so he also told me he had a fight with him too, that they, they all thought John had a fight with him, but it was George. So a little bit of my Beatles stuff. And all. By the way, I was gonna once, the original title for my book that I was gonna do was gonna be uh, Sharing My Grains of Sand. And I thought that'd be a great title. I loved it, sharing my grains of sand. But the problem is I realized if I didn't tell anybody this George Harrison story, they might think it's a gardener's book or some, you know, beachcomber. But the end result was George came to me one day and said, look, am I talking too fast? George came to me and said, drew a line on a piece of paper on the bottom on my desk. And on the, draw the line, a wiggly line. He said, Ron, imagine this is the top of the ocean. Draws this line. So now it draws another, this is the sandy bottom of the ocean, okay? And then he draws this guy, and on the top of the ocean, he draws a little boat and a little stick figure in it, and then for good luck, he drew a sun in the right corner. He said, now you can sit in that boat and float along that ocean for the life, your life until you go into the sunset and your life's over. He said, or you jump out of that boat you swim down to the bottom of the ocean, you pick up a grain of sand, you swim back up and you drop that grain of sand in your boat. Swim back down, basically every one of those grains of sand is an experience in your life that you're doing as opposed to just doing nothing. And before your boat fills with those sand grains and you sink into your pat, you know, the future. So I always loved that. But once again, sharing my grains of sand would make no sense unless you knew it was life's experiences. Now, after I came back after the Beatles, when they broke up and all the things that were going on, and when I would come back after doing movies and doing any of the things I did on the road, my uncle would have to say, you have to take a cut and pay because everybody in the office is jealous and you're my nephew and nepotism, even though you're working hard and all that. So I said, okay, but it was getting disgusting. I was getting upset with it all. And I was not as happy as I was. So when we came back after the Beatles thing, I sat there, it was 69, the beginning of 69, he said, look, you don't seem as happy. I said, I'm not. He says, well, have you made plans to leave? And as it was, my wife was pregnant. We were doing about a month, and I owed about 10 grand. So I said, I wasn't planning on leaving soon. He said, well, what you should do is build yourself a base while you're here, and then leave, and everything's cool. And I said, all right, because probably planning on having his son do it. So... Uh, for a couple of weeks, you have to understand, my uncle had the personality. He was an A-type, driving, screaming. We've got a president like that, driving, screaming, hollering, pouncing, all that. So my uncle was like that. And I was amazed that he said, no, no, go ahead, go do a couple of weeks, you know, build your own thing and do it yourself. Don't worry about me. That was good for two weeks. And then he called me one time to come into his office, and I was dealing with a group at that time, NRBQ, which was New Rhythm and Blues, and I was going to sign NRBQ, and he's screaming at the, in the office, and it's embarrassing, and I let it go. And finally, a couple of days later, I go into him, and he says, look, this isn't working. You're going to have to either decide you're either going to stay here and work 100% on my stuff or get out. And I'm like, what? We just started talking about it. He said, no, no, you either work right on me until my birthday, which was in December, which is the way you be. He said, you work until my birthday. And I said, but that makes things worse for me. So the end result, he said, well, you have to make a decision. You either stay here and work or you, you know, leave now. And so after watching him pick up the phone and ignore me, I stood up and I left, which took, uh, the good thing was when I got home to the wife, ex-wife, when I got home to the wife, she said, great because she always wanted me to leave anyhow so that part was good but now I had the money wasn't coming in so quick all the deals I was doing a few months ago is now August and then all of a sudden I get a call at two in the morning and it's Mick Jagger from Australia on uh, Ted Kelly he says Ron I'm working on this film sorry to bother you but listen we want you to do the tour and I said look Mick 
I left my uncle, I'm no longer at Abco. He said, yeah, we know, but we want you to do the tour. I said, look, I don't want any trouble with the family. So what you're gonna have to do is get my uncle's permission for me to do the tour. You know, it sounds childish, but that's the way it was. I said, you gotta, so he said, okay, we'll take care of it. So the next day, the first call I got in the morning was my uncle on his way to the airport screaming. <laughs> I don't remember what he said, but I, every now and then I'd say, listen, if you really don't want me to do the tour, just say, Ronnie, don't do the tour, and I won't do it. No, no, Ron, never said anything, left. Then it wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> next day, next day I get a call, and it's from the Stones office, this road manager, Sam Cutler, he said, Ron, <coughs> your, your uncle was fired, but they've made a deal whereby you go into the office and everybody's gonna make believe he still runs the tour, but they don't wanna embarrass him, they're trying to settle things, you just, go in and make believe everything's okay. Plus, Alan's gonna stay here for a few weeks. So, I, for a little while, I made it look like I was doing a tour through him. But now understand, the Stones wanted me to do the tour. They were packaging everything. And basically, it was just, we trust you, go do it. We had no money. The, my, their money was tied up with my uncle. He wasn't releasing it. I was 10 grand in the hole. We had nothing. I didn't even have good looks. So the end result was, we, I, I was trying to figure out what to do, and I got a phone call from the William Morris Agency, Steve Lieber and David Krebs. And they were the agents who originally had the deal before my uncle was fired, and they no longer had the deal. So they contacted me and said, can we do the deal with you? And while I was deciding, I then got a package from a guy who was a local guy here. You ever hear Bill Graham? I got a giant package from Bill Graham saying he wanted to do the tour. And so I contacted, my, I contacted Mick, and I said, Bill Graham wants to do the tour, should I just give it to him? Absolutely not. But Ronnie, whatever you do, don't tell Bill Graham no, because with his ego, he's gonna go ballistic on us. So I said, okay. Now I can't tell him no, but I gotta make sure he doesn't do the tour. Well, the first thing that happened was, I was supposed to be Bill in New York at 10 in the morning, I believe, and when I got into that, I went out walking the dogs, getting ready to go in, and it seems Bill got in early. And my wife at the time told him, Ron's out walking the dogs. He's not there for you right now. Basically, and probably Bill thought he doesn't care about you or anything. Anyhow, so I get into the office on time, but Bill was early because of his flight, and he's pissed from waiting for me. And we start talking, and I'm trying to get to the feel of everything, and he's promoting all the things he can do and all that. And I'm trying to figure a way to tell him no. And I'm finally sitting there saying, well, you know, yeah, really haven't done anything big. You do this film war, it's a little theater, but what, well, I wouldn't start, he's going crazy on me and all kinds of stuff. So at the end I tell him, I said, okay, Bill, you can do the tour, no problem. Only one thing, you can't put your name on it. You'll get paid an agent's fee of 10%, or whatever it is, you get 10%. He didn't care about the money, so I knew immediately it was all ego. He said, no, no, my name has to be on the tour. And I'm saying, no, you can't put, that's it, boom, stormed out and ran to the newspaper guy to cry and wrote a big article in the Daily News or whatever it was about how I treated him so badly. I was an assistant, something he called me at the time. But, so that was my start of a relationship with Bill, which <laughs> means something for later on. <laughs> so now we're booking, the William Morris agents come over and I say, I I'll let you be the agents for the tour, but the thing is, you guys, I need money. There's no tour without money. So they said, okay, go over to Nat Levowitz, go over to the head of William Morris, and we'll try and get you some money, you know, as an advance. So I said, all right, and take care of it. So they called me a couple of days later, come on over. And in the next couple of days, the Stones were supposed to be coming into the States. It was gonna cost me 15 grand with TWA to get the Stones into town. And then booking all the other acts they wanted me, nothing. So meanwhile, I go over to William Morris, and the financial guy, Nat, says, okay, Ron, have a check for you, and meanwhile pulls out tons of papers I gotta sign away my life to, and the check's for $15,000. And I said, I needed 50,000. Well, we can only give you 15. Well, I knew that would get the boys into town and play it by ear, so I took the 15, and he said, here's the contract for your approval. So they gave me the William Morris contract for the promoters, and when I looked at the contract, I read it, and on the first line where it said pay, it said pay William Morris, and I just drew a line through William Morris and wrote my company, which was Stone Promotions Limited, and I filled in that blank, and I, I said I approve and gave it to them. A few days later, I got the stones, and a few days later, William Morris, the guy calls and said, come on in, everything's great, but we need to see you, and I go into his office, he says, Ron, everything's great, we got the advances in, things are going the way, by the way, I insisted on percentages of all the houses to scale my way. 
He said, we got these checks in. He says, but unfortunately, they're made out to your company. So we need you to endorse them over to us so we can put them in a deposit. So I said, okay, let me see those checks. And he handed them to me, and I said, thank you. <laughs> and I stood up to walk out of the door, and he, oh, my God, you know, if you don't play the first three dates, it's the end of William Morris, it's the end of the world, whatever. We played the first three dates. So now I'm booking the 69 tour, and the, they, they basically said, here's what you're going to do, and they die. You know, they said, Chipmunk, who's the guy that did all the staging and lighting, would do the lighting. They forced me to get this photographer, Ethan Russell, on. And then they said, all, you know, Ike and Tina Turner, all these different people that they, could, that they wanted to have perform. And they were, you know, it was great. We put, laid out the whole tour, set up, don't go away. And like I said, I scaled the houses, which makes other things happen later. We didn't want promoters overcharging. The Stones insisted that it be in presidium, so that meant nobody behind them. And to me, that cut out like 25% of my income because I'm making a piece of gross. So I didn't like the fact that, but no, Ron, you know, we're artists, pure, nobody behind us. I don't want to watch my butt. So we had, so they laid out all of that. We had the whole date set up. And they were booking the tour, and everything was going smoothly. I scaled the houses. I figured that if we took 70% of the money, the promoters would make 10%. That's the way I looked at it as an accountant. So I wanted to make sure they made money. They were going to make money. If they didn't, only one guy was a little low, and I paid him Frank Field in Chicago. Anyhow, <laughs> so we've now got the fact that the tour is going along, and then we're going to come to the part, which I think is important because of what I said at the beginning about the Stones. All right, so now we come to Oakland and San Francisco to play the dates. When I come to Oakland and San Francisco, Bill had never, Graham had never paid his advance in front. I knew it was just the point he wanted to take. He wasn't going to pay it. He was proving a point. He was, didn't have to. So when we saw him, when we came into the dressing room at the first date, he had a poster along the whole wall. That would be a giant poster with him basically giving the finger to everybody. So we covered that with food within moments. It was right in front of the craft table, and we just covered that with food. And I go out to confront Bill and argue with him about the way he's doing it. And Bill and I have this uh, basically a screaming fight with one another until he's doing one of those poking me. And, you listen to me. I'm the, and he's telling me it was poking, poking. And I keep saying, don't poke me. Quit poking me. And finally, I do the only natural thing that an accountant would do. I swing my briefcase so and get him between the legs. <laughs> And he's getting ready to swing back, but he doubles over. And then the funny thing is, the guy that grabs me to pull me back is Keith Richards, <laughs> the last guy. Anyway. And the guy who pulls him is Tony Funches, who was our um, security guy. We only have one guy, this big uh, veteran, good, great, Tony Funches, great guy. And he pulled Bill out. He later went on to work with Bill. He used to laugh about it. He said he would tease him about our farcical fight that night. But so that was like a little bit of a confrontation we had there. So now here's the thing to understand, because I don't know. I said I was going to prove about the Stones and Altamont and the Hells Angels. Now, first of all, when they were advertising the show, we were on the road, and they were advertising a free concert. That's the first thing. It was the free concert, the, not the Rolling Stones free concert. It was a free concert because there were other acts. It was the Grateful Dead. It was a Jefferson Airplane. There was a lot of other groups that were performing. The Stones were just performing for free. That was basically all the thing. Everybody was performing for free. So now realize it's a free concert. It wasn't a Rolling Stones concert. Now. <laughs> so, yeah, I got to always remember these things because it's always... Anyhow, we go to... Uh, Altamont. I mean, the other thing that was going on while we were doing the tour is another San Francisco guy, Ralph Gleason, a writer for the newspaper, was saying how we were overcharging for tickets. That was a total lie. Ralph Gleason himself basically wanted people to play for free. Anyhow, he liked jazz, so you know, it had nothing to do with rock and roll. So Ralph Gleason was writing these articles, and everybody was bringing the room, believing the rumor that the Stones were overcharging. And since number one, I was getting screwed because of no back seats, and we were they were scaling the house at 850 top. The seats in Oakland were seven dollars and fifty cents. Be aware while they were raving about all. Yes, yeah, so so, th so now. We have the newspapers that are building the story about the Stones are overcharging, overcharging. Now we're coming to the end of the concert, I mean, the end of the tour. 27th, the day before Thanksgiving, the Stones, I, the Stones said to me, look, Ronnie, we want to do, we want to film two of our songs. 
because we're going to do a European tour afterwards. We want to film two of the songs, so please get us a director or somebody to film it. And they gave me a list. They gave me Haskell Wexler. Uh, there was uh, D.B. Uh, Penny Baker and Lee Cock Penny Baker and all these different people that they had they wanted me to contact to see about doing it. <coughs> and the day before we were going to, a couple of days before, I called the people, and all of them were busy, and they recommended the Basil Brothers. So the day before Thanksgiving, the day before we are playing Manhattan, the Maisels came over and met me, and we talked about doing their show, and they said, we'll go that night to Baltimore and watch the show, and then Sunday we'll come and film the songs. And we do an agreement. They, were, they came back, they said they loved it, they know what to do, and they, were, they wanted to film four songs instead of two so they could get coverage of it. So now, this was on November 28th. They were going to film the songs at Madison Square Garden, which they did. The thing before that, a little backstory on Madison Square Garden. As we were leaving for the tour, I wanted to do four dates in New York. I thought we could do it. And the garden was, no, 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 you can't. You can only do two. And I was fighting them on a deal, trying to get a really big percentage deal. And they were like, no. And they were insisting on doing their deal for two shows. And I said, well, look, if you ask for a third show, all my deal kicks in. It becomes all the percentage, everything that I said. So within 10 minutes of opening, they had to kick into my deal after the ticket sold out right away. So we were going to do three shows. Now, the three shows at the Madison Square Garden and the Maisels were going to come and film, which they did. Then after that, we went on. So now remember 28th, we now go, and the 30th was the last date of the 1969 tour, which was West Palm Beach, which had been on again, off again, depending on when they had the money in the bank. We got the money in the bank, so we went to that. That was a shambles because we sat on the runway for about six or seven hours while we didn't know it. That Nixon was in Florida, and they closed off the airport at the time. And that was, but we, they weren't telling us, hey, they just said, another 20 minutes. You know, it's one of those, another 20 minutes will be okay, we'll leave. And it was another hour, and there's another two. The only thing that was interesting about that, sitting on the tarmac, was watching our security guys snort coke, but that was a, <laughs> and smoke hash. But the other thing about that was when the tour started, I'm sorry, going, when the tour started, uh, Chipmunk brought in this guy and said, look, Chrysler's willing to give us free cars for the tour. So we had, this will tell you, they're going to give us free cars for the tour, and the guy that was bringing was this guy, John James, heavy set big dude who would promise you the world and was pretty good at delivering stuff. And he said he could deliver security too. He was close with the FBI, the feds, and he was. And the New York police. And one time when we were at the, at the uh, Plaza Hotel, we had 24 hour limousines and they'd park around it. And we had rooms for the limo drivers because you never could tell when somebody wanted to go out for a Coke. So the limos at one point were towed by the police. And they contacted me, the, the limo guy, Joey Head was the guy. Joey says, Ron, Ron, they towed the cars. So I went over to John James and said, well, you said you can do anything. So John said, wait. And he made a call, and they towed the cars back. <laughs> so basically, I, I like what he was able to do that, he that. So now that's John James. OK, so by the way, a little spoiler, he's a con man. <laughs> so now we go to the end of the tour. So now, like I told you, it's 30th. We're West Palm Beach. I leave and go back to New York. The Stones leave West Palm Beach on the 30th and go to Muscle Shows where they made some amazing music. And meanwhile, over in San Francisco, the Grateful Dead, Rock Scully, Grogan, all these other guys, even Mike Love, I mean, not, not Mike Love, yeah, that's something else, another story, but uh, Mike Lang from Woodstock, all of them had come out and they were trying to get the event going. And I had no reason to go out there. It was a free concert. I'm an accountant. I deal with money, not free stuff. So they go out, and I'm in New York, and I get a phone call saying, oh, Ron, the, the Golden Gate Park fell through. Now, by the way, this is a little, um, pardon me? <laughs> One of the parks, wherever they were playing at that time, I know it was Golden Gate Park originally, whichever it was, they turned around and said it fell through, and they couldn't get the rights. By the way, there was also a rumor that had to do with Bill Graham saying something, but now go back to the beginning. So now we've got a face. They have no location, and they found, through various people, they found this Sears Point Raceway, which is on way, Filmways, and Filmways said, they'll let you have the park to do, the raceway to do the event. Would you please come out and do the deal with them, Ron? Okay, so I fly out. This is the two days before the event. Now you understand, no planning by me, no planning by the Stones for your event. 
Grateful Dead, all West Coast people. All right, so now, <laughs> so now we're sitting there. Uh, <laughs> so while I'm, I fly out and I'm supposed to meet the guy, one of the top hotels, I remember if it was the Hopkins or the Fairmont, I go into one of them, a few years have passed. And we're talking, and he says, okay, this great event's fantastic. We're going to do a free concert with the Stones and all these. Okay, yeah. I said, great, all right. Well, I think we're supposed to pay a six. I said, I think we got a $6,000 lease for the land. He said, no, no, no. It's $100,000 for that we need for cleanup. And I said, well, people, we've got that all taken. We need $100,000 for an insurance policy, a million to $10 million insurance. I said, I've got an insurance policy covered. They said, we need another, some other reason for 100 000. So it was 300000 and we want the rights to any film. And at this time, as you've heard from my story, there was no film ever planned. You'll be, by the way, there's a lot of books out on the market from the history of the Rolling Stones that'll tell you how we had the tour, the film planned at the beginning, how the current book actually. Not true at all. We had no film planned. There was nothing. The tour was over, no paperwork. So now I come out and meet with this guy. I said, we're not giving you six, $300,000. This is a free concert. And so he says, well, no deal. And so the deal blew up. And so now there's no location, no nothing. And I turned to the, uh, the Stones. I said, no deal, great. Okay, forget it. And then all of a sudden, I go to, I want to sue Filmways because they made me fly out to L.A. So, I mean, San Francisco. So I want to sue them for the loss of the time and the bad average, all this other stuff. So this PR guy that we had said, oh, go to Mel Belli, Melvin Belli, another San Francisco guy. So I go to Belli's office. It's during the holidays before Christmas. And he starts out by saying, Ron, we're putting you in the big office. We've got the people from the killings from the, um, yeah, he just got, died. <laughs> I went blank on his, oh, yeah, okay. The Manson murders. Good thing I reminded me. Yeah, the Manson murders. <laughs> you can say things to me, guys. Hey, uh, the Manson murders. He said, we got the Manson people in the back. You guys are in front. And, and so I knew this. And he says, look, you know, I said, we want to sue this guy, and I can't forget the whole thing. He said, no, no, tell everybody to stay. And so first of all, you got a lawyer telling you to break the law. That's, I'm sorry, no thank you. I said, all I want to do is sue. He says, okay, we'll get, we'll get the guy, uh, Dick St. John. Dick St. John, I'm from Filmways. We'll talk to him and try and get him to come into the San Francisco so we can serve him. And I was going to sue him for $10 million. And supposedly you're nobody in the entertainment business unless you've been sued for $10 million. I got sued afterwards for $10 million. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, he, the deal falls apart. I call it. And so Belli, as a hustler, is trying to make something happen. And that's why he's, let's do the event and all that. And everybody's pushing for it. And I didn't want the event. I never wanted a free concert. Remember, I'm an accountant. And number two, what about the people that paid to see you guys in New York and the people that paid in Florida? I said, to me, if I paid to see you and then you're giving it for free out here, I'm pissed. So they, no, oh, no, they've been drawn to think that they overpriced the tickets and all that. And I said, all is true. You shouldn't be like that. Don't worry. Anyhow, we now go to the, we're at the meeting at Bell Eyes and we get the phone call to do Carter's Speedway in Altamont, Raceway in Altamont. And once again, I'm trying not to have a deal. I want to just get out of there, but everybody's pushing. They want to have it going. You keep people like entertainment. So turns around, and Dick Carter comes in, and they're going to have the big meeting. And then we come to that main moment that proves another point that I'm going to make to you, which is in any event that you do, the people that can get sued are number one, the location, the venue. This time would be Dick Carter Speedway. And then the promoter, the guy who put it all together, that hires the security, that does all that. And so the promoter is usually one that signs for the venue. And when they said sign, I said no. I wouldn't put the stones in that position, and I wouldn't be in that position. So turns around, and out of the back of the room, I'll sign. And it was John James, still not known as a con man, but yeah. So John James, Dick Carter's happy. John James says a sign. So John signs with his company. Young American Enterprises, so you know it's a scam. So Young American Enterprises, so we were never on the hook for any of that. If you're looking to who to sue as who's liable, promoter John James, the venue, Dick Carter's Raceway. Now for the Stones part. You now, remember, once again, the Stones still aren't even in San Francisco. They came in the day before. They, so we come in, and uh, uh, when we go, I go the day that they're in there, we're going to go out to the venue because Keith says, 
I want to see what it's like. You know, let's go see what it is. So Mick and Keith and I, Stanley Booth, I think uh, Tony Funches, we get in a limo at night and we drive out to Livermore and we hear the hammering. It was, it was a magical night. I mean, it was cold, peaceful, and all you hear is hammering as they're building the scaffolds and putting up the lighting and doing all the stuff to set up the stage for what would happen the next day. And Keith says, you know, I'm going to stay. You guys go back. And by the way, while we were standing there, we walked over and we walked into the crowd and there were little fires with people that are sitting around the fires. And we went over and they'd hand you a joint and you'd smoke joints or big gallons of wine. And it was just that way. And then when Mick and Keith walked off, I turned off and a line about like 20 people long was just quietly following. Nobody came over and bothered everybody just walking in peaceful. It was so Keith stayed and we're blissful. The next day's coming, and we're going to fly in by helicopter. And I go with Mick and Charlie and all that. Bill didn't make it because he was out shopping. He was a smart stone. He was always buying antiques while the rest of the people were buying drugs. On it. <laughs> so we turned around, and, and uh, yeah. So Mick and, Keith, Mick and I get off the helicopter, and the security guard uh, beware, security guard. Security guard says, let me guide you, young guy. And the guy starts to lead us right in the audience straight towards the stage. And the minute we start to walk into the audience, a guy leaps up and punches Mick in the mouth. And I go to grab the other cop, we grab him, and I want to kill the guy, but Mick's, no, 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 no. And we walk in there to get us out of this place, and we walk back, and we're in a trailer, just a small little trailer where everybody got into backstage and I wanted to look around and see how everything was and by the way around the trailer were all the Hells Angels and they assigned two Hells Angels to me. I had one guy that was about like touch the ceiling and this other short guy like that. I run to get things done they were gone in a minute. I ran and they never ran after me so that was all over. I meet them and now the stage was put together so quickly it was a little it was about like that high. There were no steps to get up to it to mount it from back. So instead of stairs they had a big Hells Angel. And basically, the Hells Angel would hand you his hand and pull you up, and he's that big. So the time I offered my hand, remember, I'm the straighter-looking guy, short hair, and I hand him my hand, and he goes to pull me up. But when he's pulling me up, he's like this. It's like when you pull you up, you get punched if they don't know you. And so as he's pulling me up, luckily, Sonny Barnes, oh, no, he's with us, and so they let me on. But that was the stage security. <laughs> so... So now, the, when I got up there, the, the, it started to get dark and vile. Now, here's an important part to it. Well, I've just segue to the fact that everybody was talks about that $500 and that the Rolling Stones paid $500 to hire the Hells Angels. Here's the true story. <laughs> I talked to Sam Culler. I remember, when nobody, there were no rumors. There's nothing going around at the time. When I got backstage with Sam, I said, what's going on? He said, well, he said, the Angels drove in this school bus filled with beer and ice, which that bus you all, if you saw, give me shelter, brought it in with beer and ice, filled. He says... But, you know, they were drinking, and as everybody got drunker and crazier, instead of passing cans of beer, they were throwing them all over, and people were getting hit in the head and getting hurt. And he says, you can't go to the Hells Angels and say, stop throwing that beer, or give me that beer, or anything like that. He said, so what I did was, he says, I went over, and I offered to buy the beer for the crew. I said, the crew wanted some beer, so I paid 500 for the ice and beer for the crew working on the thing. That's how that story got years later. So now that's the 500 because I never paid for any of this stuff. That's the other point. Now, we're backstage, running around. Oh, yeah, I left out the mic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll stick with this. Hey, I'm backstage. Right now. I, I left out the Madison Square Garden story, but it had elephant crap and all kinds of other stuff, so we'll stay with this story. <laughs> I'll come back. Uh, encore. <laughs> yeah, so... I'm running around, and you stood on the stage, and I don't know if any of you have ever felt evil. I mean, <laughs> anyhow, it was black. It was really just felt like you knew that there was evil stuff around. And it was so bad that a rumor came to me saying, run, run, a, K a tower toppled, and 40 people are trapped underneath this tower. We need doctors and help. You've got to come to it, man. You've got to come. And so I'm starting running around looking trying to find out if there's really a tower because they're, they're big towers and that was just the type of attitude the acid did to their heads or whatever it was like that kind of mentality so the next thing is the stones are supposed to go on and like I said it's we had heard the stuff we didn't see all the beatings going on at the time 
but we had heard that you know it was violent, and, and it turned out it was not the Hell's Angels so much as the guys who wanted to be Hell's Angels. It was the initiates, and we're going long guys. So, so, whoops. <laughs> Anyhow, so, well, we'll get out of this. I won't do the encore, all right? So the uh, the initiates were beating people up. We see all the things going on, and the thing that always got me was I was running around seeing all the crazy stuff, but even with all that madness, the stones went up on that stage. And if you see the pictures, there's when they're just surrounded by all this. And when I saw some of them, some of the guys were out of their minds, the Hells Angels. But we had been in a lot of violent things in the time. I thought this was bad, but they just went on and played and did their, and the thing that was more amazing than anything was Keith. He would challenge the angels. We know what happened to Tony Bally. I mean, what's his name? Um, the, the guy from the Jefferson Airplane, he got punched out from challenging the angels. Keith would stay down, you tell him to stop. And basically they respected Keith enough to let that go. So the whole event went, all right. At the end, I'm running on the side and they say, a guy got stabbed, we need an ambulance. And so I had known where the ambulance was because I was gonna use that to get out of there to the helicopter with the stones. <laughs> So I, had, I went looking, I told the driver, stay by the car, we'll be over by the side of the stage on the left. I went running over there to get the ambulance. <clears throat> I see the ambulance, no driver, which is usual for these guys. Anyway, no driver, I'm screaming up and down, running, where's the driver of the ambulance? We need, because the guy's stabbed. And a cop says, come here, come here. I see, he says, are you running about the guy that gets stabbed? I said, don't worry, he's dead. Just like that. And I was like, you don't have to run anymore. I was like, oh, you know, so that was horrible. And then, so all I know is a guy died, got stabbed to death. I meet the Stones afterwards. We jump in the helicopter. Everybody and his, anybody that could fit in came running to get into the helicopter to make sure they got out of there. So they dive in. We take off, and then you hear the words you don't ever want to hear from the helicopter pilot or any pilot. We've got a problem. <laughs> and it's like, what is it? So, well, we're too heavy when we lift it off. We're overweight, so I can't hover down to land. We're going to have to glide in like an airplane. It's going to be a hard landing. You know, like I said at the time, the angels didn't kill us. Maybe God would. So as the end, it turned around. We got in. All was okay. And then um, the point that I have to make about all this, now realize, no film. The, uh, all the things that we didn't put on the event. The Stones didn't do any of this. We were brought there as part of a free concert. The Grateful Dead performed all that. I always felt that it was a case of the Bill Graham being upset and all that, the negative stuff, Ralph Gleason, who was a close friend of Bill Graham, all those things were compounded to do the things that happened at that time to force us into that situation. But that's still, nobody hired the Hells Angels. You can't hire the Hells Angels. So that, to begin with, I thought was ridiculous. But once again, I always thought that this was a cover story for the West Coast, no offense. But you know, it was a wait. All your guys did bad things, but late, let's borrow. Man, you know, let's blame the foreigners. We'll blame the immigrants. It's those guys. It's those, those Brits. And so that was you know. We went off and did European tour and did all that. But I've talked a lot and rattled on. So how are we doing for time, guys? Because I promised you all questions and asked if, if you wanted. Yes. <laughs> I had so much more. <laughs> yes. Well, they, they, they didn't, it wasn't that they wanted to look what, what looked best. It wasn't anything, it was from the four songs. That, I used to always think it was brown sugar, but it wasn't even done yet. Brown sugar was from the, after they'd done. See, I always thought it was that because of the fact they did brown sugar at Muscle Shoals. You know, but it wasn't. I, I don't know what four songs. It was whatever looks good, guys. But that segue, the point I was going to go on real quick, I got to tell you. <laughs> so you made that. On the flight back, remember, there was only the thing to do the four songs. So David Mazel said, look, you know, I think we've got a movie. And by the way, we hadn't even seen the murder yet. He said, I think we've got a movie, at least a rock and roll movie. We can do something. You want to do a movie? I said, okay. So he and I did the deal on the plane to do a feature film. And then when he got back in New York, he said, oh, my God, we, we got the footage. And the thing that everybody else has is Jagger never wanted the murder in the footage. Mick didn't, it took a year to get Mick to sign the agreement. We didn't get the deal for a year because he didn't want to do it. He thought it was negative and bad, but the Maisels wanted to tell a story. And I always thought that the film took on a story of its own as opposed to being a rock and roll film. It was something about society that time and all those things that happened. And we did that film deal on the plane two weeks actually after the concert was done. So if you guys have any books that say we had a film before, I just throw those away. 
Okay, now, any more questions? So, weren't the dead supposed to play? They were, they were in the film. They were there. Weren't the dead supposed to play? Good, I forgot that, because I'm old and I forget things. The Grateful Dead showed up and ran away like cowards. <laughs> and, sorry, but the, the thing that happened with the Grateful Dead, which we didn't know until I saw the footage, I always said, you know, if the Grateful Dead went up and did about one of their two or three hour sets, I think everything would have been okay. You know, but they just turned around and ran. So another point about the West Coast guys. <laughs> Well, well, before I had the hell, yeah, the, the Hell's Angels were the, what they say security. What the Grateful did with the Hell's Angels, which is what was being done here, because of the same people, the Hell's Angels guarded the electronics. They guarded the generator so that nobody tripped over the power cords or pulled the power or messed with that. So the so the Hell's Angels basically guarded the generators, and for that right, we were able to stay around the stage and hang out. No more questions. Oh, where? Yes. So I was there in Altamont, and as I recall, um, the Stones were there, but there was a long delay before they actually came out on the stage. And the energy in the place became weird. And people who came from Mars knew it was the Stones, and they didn't come out for a while. So you were there. What, what did that okay. Okay. The, the question is, why did the Stones take so long? Yeah. And at the okay. The Stones, usually, it, that was a case of they were telling us they weren't ready for us yet. It was that the Stones would have gone on right away to get out of there. They're not stalling to build up drama. They, there was nothing. They just wanted to go play and get out of there. It was the case. It was, it was the, the organ. It was like Sam Cutler. It was uh, Rock Scully. It was Emmett Grogan. It was all the guys doing all the events there and Sam coming over and telling us. So they were sitting there saying, wait, wait. It, 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 we wanted to get out of there. It wasn't exactly a pleasant place sitting in a little small airstream with you know, 10 people. <laughs> Anything? Oh, yes, no? Okay, don't be afraid. Yes. Well, I was doing the two, uh, how did the Stones and I part? We never parted really because I always had a piece of them would give me shelter. <laughs> so, so the, uh, we, it wasn't, it was so much as life as you all grow on. At the end of 70, number one, they wanted me, I was supposed to do a deal with Rupert Lowenstein, who was the business manager, to do a deal to stay on and all that. But they were, I was going to make money touring, but they were, we didn't know when the next tour was going to be. It could be another year, it could be another two years or five years. So number one, that was one thing. And I really didn't like the business. I don't like, <laughs> you know, as much as it was, I didn't like dealing with, with people. I didn't like backstabbing people, all the music business people. So to hang around with me, they wanted me to be the head of the record company. And I just couldn't imagine. I, I, I'm an Erding and said, Ronnie, you'd be the president of Rolling Stones Records. And I was like, he said, we'll have, we'll, you know, please, we'll have Marshall as the front. And I'm like, N I just didn't want to be a nine to I said, do I have to wear a suit? He says, yeah, no. I have to be a nine to five guy. I couldn't do it. I didn't want to do that. So that was part of it. I didn't want to run the record company with him, and I wasn't going to do tours. And I made money from, and I liked doing things where I had a piece of the action and not being involved. And after being with the Beatles and Stones and Sam Cooke and all that, there wasn't any group that I could pay attention to that, oh yeah, who am I gonna go after? You know, it's anything going from those guys would be a step down. And dealing with egos is bad enough with entertainers. So at least these guys are liked and got along with. So I just got into other things. I did, I helped friends out. I did my friends rock and roll buses. I did anything and everything I wanted to do. I believed that I could do that. That's how we parted. And then I also think it was saving my life because if I would have gone to France and done the whole thing doing that, I'd probably be dead. The heroin would have got me then, <laughs> instead of later. <laughs> All right, one question. I don't know if this is inbounds or out of bounds. So your uncle is pretty well known in the history of it. Yes. So what was his story getting to the Beatles and then I think being recommended by John Lennon to go with the Stones? And no? No. Okay, so being asked about my uncle, uh, Alan, who had the Beatles, but what happens is he had the Stones. And what happens is he had actually Sam Cooke and all the other ones, and then basically the agents recommended my uncle to the Stones. I think some other, Mickey Most did. Herman's Hermits. Mickey Most recommended my uncle to the Stones, and the Stones hired him, and they were happy with him. And they're the ones that talked to the Beatles, to John about it. That's how it went. They, he recommended the Beatles. Afterwards, he regretted it. And all these things, like I said, there's a lot of stories about my uncle. But it's like anybody else. 
the person that I would say would judge most about my uncle would be Andrew Oldham, who was the original manager with another person. They managed him. And I always thought Andrew would be the one. And when my uncle passed away at his, th he, Andrew stood up and said that if it wasn't for my uncle making them all the money and knowing what he was doing, Andrew said he could have never done it. And so he thanked them, and I was, that was pretty big. So that was the point. He made them all that money. What happens is he made them the money, and when he did it, he took a piece of the equity. He took a piece of the publishing. And that's like sacrosanct, and I don't blame him. And they hated that because he did it in a kind of sneaky way. So on that way, he was making sure he got paid, but on the other way, it kind of alienated everybody, and he was out for himself. Does that answer? <laughs> Anything else? Uh, yes. oh, so I'll come back to you. When was the last time you talked to the Stones? Last time I talked to the Stones, let's see, I talked to Charlie a few years ago. That was about it. It's like we all, yeah, in fact, I sent Charlie a book. I'm waiting to hear back from him on that. Too good. I started, the question is, did I start as a tour account and do the deals? The answer is kind of because I started actually as an accountant. I, wa I was just doing all the accounting for everything, so I never counted as a tour accountant. A tour accountant, I would think, would do the accounting afterwards. I was on the road working with them. I think that was the other reason that we got along. It was because they realized that I cared. I really care about what I do. So when we did, everybody was doing it with feelings, so that's why I was always with them. I mean, look at all these pictures now. I, I, I also wonder if one of the other reasons I was with them, as I see the picture of me with the money in my mouth, you know, putting my money well I always figured that maybe the other reason they always had me around was because I paid for everything but I think it was because we were buddies <laughs> hey, oh yes yeah, so that's it hey, uh, uh. I dance no <laughs> now I did a book and I, you know, nobody hires me I'm an old guy so I go around talking to people who want to hear stuff from me I'm living history <laughs> yes <laughs> the question was, how did I change the rev sharing, make it rev sharing as opposed to the way it used to be flat fees before the Stones, I, th I think Elvis got 5% at one time. Being an accountant, when I went in, I already knew the cost of the venues. I knew how much it cost to do the operations, the security, all the other stuff like that. And I knew, based on the Stones being the big hit that they were, I just went and say, okay, I know you're going to sell out. So if you're going to sell out, if I say you're going to make a million dollars total gross sales, and I take 70%, you give me $700,000, and then the 300000 you pay all your expenses, and they end up making ten. I knew it as an accountant, so that's why I did it like that. And the other main reason that drives most things is we needed the money. <laughs> and so because then if I went on a straight flat fee, I, you know, I was going on gross sales. They were popular. Take advantage of it. Double your money. Anything else? <laughs> no, no problem. Yeah. I, I, I love the questions. Okay, now I can give you the Madison Square Garden Show. This was a question about how much we made per show. My two bad guys. Okay, Madison Square Garden. We didn't have the contract. The day I got the contract, the day before Madison Square Garden, the garden had thrown out our writer and stuck on their own writer about that thick that basically said the Rolling Stones couldn't play past midnight in New York. If they played pay past midnight, we had to pay golden time to the union, and it would cost $20,000 from the Stones. So that was the original thing they were saying to us. And they also didn't pay the advance that I was supposed to get. So the night of the concert, the day it's all going on, still hadn't gotten money, still don't have a contract. We're supposed to start at midnight. I contact Steve Lieber and say, get the garden guys here. We don't have a deal, and we're going to walk. And so, I, and so Steve gets on the right in front of the audience says, anybody of such and such from the garden? And they came backstage where it was Ringling Brothers and Bailey Circus had been before. And I meet with the Madison Square Garden guys, and I'm like, you know, if you guys don't uh, honor our deal and forget this crap you've said, we're leaving, and I'm going to go out and make an announcement to the Madison Square Garden audience that you don't care about them, you screwed the stones, you won't pay them, and you don't like anybody. And I said, they'll destroy this place. So they signed my deal. <laughs> No, they, but here's the thing to understand. I met, the, I met the garden people during the intermission. 
right after I can Tina, which was a phenomenal act. And so after I can Tina, I had to get them there because the Stones were getting ready to go on and we'll like, as opposed to people thinking that they'd delay and so no, no, they wanted to go on and they're getting ready. And I go to them, I say, look, I'm negotiating with the guard and they're trying to screw us around. Do me a favor, don't come out until I tell you to. And they just said, screw you. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> you know, they're going to go out when they're going to go out. It had nothing to do with me, so I had to make sure I got that deal done quick. And it worked. But that was the garden. And yes. Did that answer any other? <laughs> All right. Okay. That was, they made close to a quarter of a million. And the only thing that, well, I was, no, I'm sorry, it was 150, and I think we got another 50. Yeah. Because what happens is three shows. And when we did that to understand the garden, because they didn't pay the money in front, I got really mad at them because I was a little guy who had, anyhow, I basically said, I want the money counted out in front of me because I don't trust you. It was 150, that was it. And they brought out, and I bet a bank one, it was on the corner, we had to go in the basement, and we had a PR guy, Pete Bennett, who looked like a big mafia guy, and I said, Pete, stand there like that. And Pete stood there, and they counted out the 150,000 to me, and I walked out with the cash at the time. <laughs> but there's a lot, yeah, look, there's a lot of stories, but. <laughs> The good thing is you remind me. Uh, Anything else, team? Do you do, do you represent sure. percentages of, do you do percentages of growth in the garden? Yes. We, I, sure, did I do a percentage of growth? Absolutely did a percent. We did 60% of growth at the garden at the time. Like I said, they had to kick into my deal. And the other thing that was really interesting is that writer that they had done, they had already taken the money out for the union, the 20 grand, and I got to go over and meet the union guy and gave me back the 20 grand. Yeah, they were controlled by the mafia. <laughs> in those days. But any, anything else? Uh, yes, in the corner. <laughs> The question is whether the Grateful Dead and the Hells Angels partners. Oh, I would tend to believe that, you know, they, I'm sure they became friendly and they probably were all doing drugs together. So that could have made a commodity that goes at the time is whether the Hells Angels. Yeah, I mean, but the end result, I have no idea on that. But I do know that the, the Hells Angels always were at the Grateful Dead shows taking care of the generators. That, I mean, that's what I was told. I was never there. Anything? Oh, right. Was there, there was another one. Uh, that's it. Okay. Let's see. We did good. Yeah. Oh, well, I did the Madison Square Gardens. All right. <laughs> oh, thank you. What I forget.